Hi, I'm Maddie Hockaday, also known as the Anne of this relationship. And I'm Holly, the Leslie. We love Parks and Rec. We love behind the scenes. And we love each other. This is literally the best Parks and Recreation rewatch show. We're your park pals. There's a park and some pals and there's also therapy too. Hi, Maddie. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Park Pals, everybody. Welcome to episode two, uh, canvassing. Where Are you ready to go canvassing, Maddie? I am so ready to go canvassing. So ready to talk about all the people we're about to meet. Oh my gosh, so many people. Um, well, before we get into that, uh, I wanted to do a brief recap moment to kind of touch on some things that we either missed or that I missed or or that, some, I don't know, that I just thought of. Um, so recap from last episode. Okay, so you will be very excited about this. The last episode, we talked about the uh, machine that you use to skip, to scoop the dirt uh, up from like creating the pit or whatever. Yes. And lofty. we talked about lofty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jinx from Bob the Builder. Uh, and so Lofty, I looked this up. I felt like such a creep, but I loved it at the same time. Um, Lofty is uh, like a crane with a hook on the end. Um, so like if you're picking up logs that are tied together, like that's what she does. Um, but I looked it up and it's kind of disappointing the name of this. But the official name of what I was talking about, like the little scooper thing is called a loader. Like oh. it just loads. I was like, that's. They did not get creative at all <laughs> with that. <laughs> right. But Lofty is super cute and I really like her. So I uh, think that if we just added like a little scooper thing to her, she can do that Agreed. too. So it's I fun. think we should make Lofty our uh, profile picture for a day. Oh my gosh. I agree. Strong women. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's so real. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, okay, so secondly, this doesn't really go for the episode technically, but it kind of does. So um, my uh, mom listened to the podcast and because I she's like the literally, I think, the first one that heard it. And she was super like approving of it. So applause <laughs> to us for that. Yes. <laughs> Shout out to Mama Constant. Yes, Mama Constant. Hi, Mom. Um, she was mad at me for using the F word. <laughs> <laughs> that is legitimately when you said you showed your mom, I was like, can my mom handle me not using like five year old language the entire time? <laughs> Let's think this through. <laughs> I know. And I try sometimes really hard to make sure that I am edited around her because I know she doesn't like it. Um, and mm. but I just like I don't know. It's just like who I am now. I is who I am. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it just comes out too. you know, like especially when you're like passionate about something or surprised about something. It just happens. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and then let's see. Um was I gonna say oh she said that I said uh rewinded instead of rewound so deepest apologies <laughs> to everyone thank you for looking out dear mom <laughs> I don't know how I didn't catch that I know it's okay uh I know and I, I asked her I was like did I correct myself or did I just keep going and she was like no you just kept going and I was like okay whatever Okay, so that's that. Uh, and then the other one was that um, I looked up. Okay, so you know how I talked about how I'm like really weirdly obsessed with these pigeons in the courtyard. Uh, Wikipedia yes. says that they're fake pigeons, and I just do not agree. I think that there must be some fake and some real. So I don't know about this, but it is an ongoing thing. This like the pigeons are literally going to be, if you listen to Office Ladies, it's going to be like the the plants at reception that yes. Angela's like weirdly obsessed with finding and. That's what that's what it is for me with these pigeons because I'm just like I don't understand them. <laughs> We're gonna track it. Yes, yes, we are. Um, okay. Also, l last episode we didn't really mention this, but I think some people know it if you're like a super fan of either The Office or Parks and Rec or just in general of Mike Schur and Greg Daniels. But um, we talked about uh, or we had like thought about how this was supposed to be a spinoff from The Office. Um, mm -hmm. But something that I found in my research was that they were talking about a spinoff. Really, the the idea of that came because of the Stanford office and in, uh, in the office and how that could have been its own series. But then uh, but then, you know, they just kind of kept going with the Parks and Rec idea and they did this instead. And so like Greg Daniels apparently was re was really like weary of leaving the office. But Ben Silverman, who was the co-chair of NBC at the time, really rallied for the office. So they kept bugging him. And that's kind of how Parks and Rec like was founded. Evidently. 
And then also that was a fun thing to learn that everyone kind of knows, I feel, but something to be reminded of is that pretty much everyone that is a creator or like head honcho has worked on SNL, Saturday Night Live. Um, Mm -hmm. So Greg Daniels and Mike Schur were, um, you know, writers and Amy Poehler obviously was a writer and performer. And I thought that that was really interesting. Yeah. And I think we'll continue to see that through the the series when we mention the directors and the writers and even some of the actors that come through too so yeah totally um and then the last thing I have in my recap is that the so they did actual research which I think I mentioned this briefly that a lot of the uh storylines in Parks and Rec are based off of truthful things that happened in the community and that one of the things that I found uh that I was researching was that they actually did find someone that they interviewed at a local government who or like I don't know where it was if it it was probably somewhere in California but it was a local government person that said that they'd been trying to build a park for 18 years oh my god and they're like still in the process I don't know I wish that I knew more details of like did that park ever get built or where are they in the process or like I don't know but I really hope that I know I do too so if you're that person that they interviewed I don't know how we would find you but reach out (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, seriously, we would love for you to come on and tell your story because that sounds like awful, but also yeah. what we all fell in love with about Parks and Rec. So be cool yeah. to hear a real story. Totally. In 18 years? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Ugh, that's so crazy. That is ridiculous. Oh. Anyway, so that is the end of my recap. Uh, and now we can move into officially starting our season one, episode two, Canvassing. Beautiful. Would you like to introduce the director and writer? Yes, I'd love to. Okay, so it was written by Rachel Axler. Her most notable credits are three episodes of Veep. Uh, She's done The Daily Show. She worked on one episode of New Girl. Uh, She wrote three episodes for Parks and Rec, including this one, The Stakeout, and The Camel. So it sounds like she was there for the first season, kind of into the second season, as far as a writer, anyway. Uh, Mm -hmm. She also worked as a story editor for a couple of uh, seasons, and the story editor which I think we uh, talk about in later episodes, but uh, just as a brief, like, you know, Hollywood break moment, sort of, or any script break, I guess, uh, story editors are really, truly that. They edit the story to make sure that it's really cohesive, that it's all chronologically happening, that it makes sense for the story of, like, it, you know, certain scenes happening before other scenes and kind of placing it all together. You know, how you see, like, the storyboard in writer's rooms. You know, they're overseeing all of that. Um So, yes, boss bitch Rachel Axler. (laughs) Yes, a female writer. Mm -hmm. Right out the gate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Then it was directed by Seth Gordon, who was actually in this week's commentary on the DVDs. He directed um, something called King of Kong, which I did not watch, but it is an actual documentary. So he has a lot of familiarity with how to get those like spy shots and, you know, talking heads and stuff to make it seem like an actual documentary. Mm. Nice. I also have written down that he did Horrible Bosses, Identity Thief, oh. Theft, Thief, the one with Melissa McCartney. I can't read my own writing. <laughs> oh, Melissa McCarthy. Uh, yes, Jason Identity. Bateman. Identity Thief. It is. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then he did yeah. um, two part two episodes of The Office. So there's that connection where Mike Schur and, um, and Greg Daniels knew where to go, right? Because he did um, Double Date. So that's when... Pam and Jim go on a date with Michael and Pam's mom and then oh, right awkward delivery part one so when Pam has her baby although I may have just gotten my timeline super wrong because That's okay Greg Daniels left at the end of season five right or in the middle of season five for this that's what we decided uh, yes and those mm-hmm. those episodes are in season six so they they found him for Parks and Rec first yeah yeah I'm sure though that yeah I'm sure that they it's all connected somehow. It's all an yeah. Illuminati of Parks and Rec and <laughs> <laughs> the Deedle Dees of Greg Daniels. <laughs> yes. SNL, Parks and Rec, and The Office. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Forever. We have to come up with some sort of, like, name for them, for their the little Trinity. ecosystem. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> of comedy. <laughs> anyway. Uh, right. So, that's all I have for that. Uh, I would love a summary if you're ready. I'm ready. Let's do it. So... In season one, episode two of canvassing, Leslie is rearing and ready to go with her new committee, setting a town meeting or a public forum for tomorrow night. She has warned that this is way too early to share with the public by Mark, but she figures canvassing will solve everything. Leslie's steamroller controlling side comes forth through canvassing, as does Tom's entrepreneurial spirit. 
Mark and April's laziness is also shown when they're play found playing rock band with Andy instead of canvassing. Ron is pushing Leslie to go through with the public forum to appease his boss. Um, and her Leslie's forcefulness brings an unwanted guest to the forum and she talks she talks her way out of a sticky situation by literally talking too long so no one can vote. <laughs> nice. Yes, I call this one the uh, cameo episode because I just yeah. feel like so many fucking people are in this show or in this episode that we've seen before in other shows. Well, and I think this is like, I mean, right, we have so many connections between this and The Office and you look just immediately out the gate and in episode two, we have so many guest stars coming on and you don't really see that in the office. I mean, most of the characters are right there in the office all the time. And you didn't have every once in a while you had guest appearances, but you never had like this many in one episode, especially in the first season. Yeah, totally. I think that's just building on the world that the office kind of had such a big, you know, uh, following. And now they've got, like we talked about in the last episode, a little bit more of a budget, a little bit more of a community that they've built kind of, of who they like to work with and all that kind of good stuff. So right. yeah, it's really amazing to see. Yeah, for sure. Okay. I really love this cold open. I think it's freaking it's hilarious. One of my uh, evidently, <laughs> <laughs> evidently they did this at the last minute because it was Easter time. And so they wanted to just get some Easter, st uh, stuff in there. And, um, so I thought that was so funny, though. These kids are hilarious, like all the pouting and all the crying that's happening. Don't worry, we'll yeah. find one. <laughs> I know that's the <laughs> best part is when Leslie is like, don't worry, we'll find one. And then there's a back shot of Tom just shaking his head like, nah, I didn't hide any eggs. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I also have to say, as someone who works with children, I should not laugh as hard at that cold open as I do. <laughs> but it's just so funny I don't know how they make it like okay to laugh at but there's this one great piece because like you're saying right the kids are so good at this but at 24 seconds there's a girl that like slams her Easter basket into the ground and just the tantrum that she pulls like rightfully so like that's really frustrating and you're like five you know but it's just the way she acts it out as a kid is just so well done so I know and that was so hilarious, so over dramatic and over the top, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is perfect for like a kid, right? On Easter, mm -hmm. expecting to find eggs and candy. <laughs> well, also, I have a quick thing too, in not in the cold open, but uh, just a side note is that so there's a cardinal in uh, the opening credits next to Nick Offerman who plays Ron's face, and he is Nick Offerman is in the commentary this week, and he said that he really really likes that cardinal next to his face. I thought that that was worth mentioning. <laughs> So send him a cardinal. <laughs> Anything Nick Offerman says is worth mentioning. Yeah. <laughs> well, are we ready to move on to the mom visit then? Yes. Uh, oh, my gosh. We meet Leslie Nope's mom. Yes. I love this actress so much. Yes. So Leslie's mom is played by Pamela Reed. Um, mm -hmm. She wasn't in a lot that I, like, recognized. Something mm -hmm. called Kindergarten Cop and then also mm -hmm. Jericho. Things I haven't heard, but like she's phenomenal like even in this opening scene she just commands the room which I feel like is hard to do when you act with Amy Poehler <laughs> you know yeah totally well and I think that she is such a good dynamic to have with Amy Poehler uh because she yeah I think that she's a little bit more of a maybe strict harder version of Leslie you know what mm -hmm. I mean I thought that that was a really great casting and we'll get into kind of the first thoughts of when she was casted because there are some really cool there's some really cool information about her but yeah uh I love also that you can tell right off the bat like you said not only does uh, Marlene like command the room but because of that I think Leslie just really respects her and mm -hmm. she has always wanted her mom's approval and she's like you know, she's older. I feel like her her Leslie is now at a point when she can just be like, okay, she's my mom, but like we're both humans, but she still really looks up to her and wants her to, you know, approve of anything she's doing. It's really sweet, but also kind of like heartbreaking. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I feel like their relationship transforms throughout the show, mm -hmm. right? Because the version of Leslie's mom that I like, like, and kind of go towards is the one at their engagement party her and Ben's engagement party spoiler mm -hmm. alert mm -hmm. um but you know <laughs> it's like because she's kind of she sees the dysfunction in Ben's family and she's kind of there to support Leslie whereas you look at this here right and 
the first thing she says to Leslie is, in or out, Leslie, the doorway is creepy. <laughs> I know. Like, which which is just such great writing. But, like, if that was my mom, I'd be like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll leave, okay, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I Yeah, and that's funny that you say that because they – um just about their dynamic because that is something that they said like in the commentary that they really wanted to introduce Leslie's mom early on so that you could really see that evolution and kind of see how they play off of each other and react to each other. Yeah. And she was really good at improvising evidently. Um, Pamela Reed who plays Marlene like we talked about uh, in the casting office when she went in for this audition he was kind of uh, I think it was Seth Gordon actually the director of Mm -hmm. this who was in the casting room when they did this or when she was auditioning and they said that she would just come up with stuff on the fly but like it was so grounded and so real in her character that it just really spoke to him like oh my gosh she can it, you can throw anything at her and she can make it real and and, and you know I was gonna say characterize is that a word <laughs> yeah just really make a character yeah out of what she was improvising so um that's definitely why they casted her and I thought that was really cool yeah that is really cool and it, I mean it added so much right Mm-hmm. really cool i i really love this too because bringing it back to the office because we love the office um we don't mm-hmm. we don't get to meet michael's mom right like right. we hear conversations on the phone with her but like we don't get to meet her so i think it's this really great dimension that's added to leslie that michael didn't have mm-hmm. right that we get to meet part of her family and kind of where she's coming from so i i like yeah. that too so yeah Yeah, well, so she asks her mom if she wants to come to her first committee. Leslie is so proud and happy that she is having, like, a committee town hall moment. Uh, And you can tell that Leslie's, like, really proud of it, but then her mom is all like, oh, well, you know, you know how busy I am. And I think it's just so cute because, well, not cute, um... I think Amy Poehler's cute in general, but, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I, first of all, I felt so bad for Leslie in that moment, but I feel like in that scene, you go through so many emotions within like 20 seconds. Like first she's really like excited and proud. And then she's like, yeah, whatever. I mean, I fake invited you when she says she can't come or when or that Marlene's too busy. And then she like turns it back around when Marlene says that she'll try to come. And like, it's just so many facial expressions and ideas and emotions and feelings within 20 seconds. And I was like, Oh, Amy Poehler, you queen. Yeah, it's so well done. I think this whole this whole scene, I have to this is not on their uh, their relationship, but the forum is being held at a place called Smithfield Community Center. Uh-huh. So I felt the need to look that up to see if it's real because that's <gasps> how yes. we do. And um, I found out that there is not something called the Smithfield Community Center, but there is a Smithfield Recreation Center in Utah hmm. and it's in Smithfield, Utah. So oh. anybody in Smithfield, shout out, because yeah. I don't know where else Hello, they would have gotten that name. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was wondering that, too. I wonder. That's a good question. Okay, we'll have to research that, or I'll have to somehow slide into somebody's DMs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this podcast is going to be all about. Sliding into Literally, DMs though. to get more info. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I'm at the courtyard now. So um, why does she need a gavel? <laughs> That's my sole question because I know like honestly the kid in me would also be like yes I'm bringing a gavel to this meeting but like Mm -hmm. you know I'm professional I'm leading the meeting yes Yes, but it's also like the wood and hitting those you have you ever sit at sat at some of those tables that are like the the wire yeah like the metal mesh yeah they're not fun first of all because you can get Mm -hmm. your skin pinched in them so just Mm. like shout out to anybody looking for a table don't buy one of those because they're not fun but also (laughs) like that's not a pleasant sound and the way Anne flinches like I think we see like Anne still kind of finding her place in this group because if you fast forward like two seasons and Leslie did that Anne would be like Leslie or you know she would respond differently (laughs) right so yeah she's still finding her grounding which I think is really great character work because she's not just going to come in and be like I belong here now you know yeah, totally. So. Yeah, it's really cool to see that evolution. Speaking of which, Tom does not care about his fashion, I feel. Or maybe he <laughs> feels that this is fashion at this point because he's wearing a polo collared shirt. Lacoste, I believe, is the brand name with that, like, alligator yeah. or whatever mm-hmm. the hell is on the, like, little, you know, the chest breast pocket yeah. thing. 
yeah, chest. There's no breast pocket. I don't know what the hell I <laughs> said that for. But anyway, yes, uh, I was like, that is not something I feel that the Tom that we know and love would be wearing. Right. But that comes back. That effing Lacoste shirt, but in different colors, <laughs> comes back so frequently in this mother effing first season. <laughs> <laughs> we will be tracking it don't you worry yeah. and what color is this one holly this one's dark green okay all right i want to track yeah. the colors too that's important yeah it totally is we'll see like maybe he's just feeling feisty one day so he wears like a different color this one i feel like he felt professional yet you know classy <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, i don't know i'm totally making up a backstory that does not exist right. but anyway <laughs> Um, And then we go into how she says that she was voted best dressed by 87 votes in her elementary school or middle school or something. Because she like, what was that for? Oh, she was like good at persuading people or whatever the hell. And then there were only 63 people in her class. So I'm wondering, I am so imagining her going up to like my brain went on this like super long ass tangent where she goes up to her like teachers and janitors and everything to get them to vote for her for best dress. Because like how else could she have done that apart from writing it in herself which I don't I mean she has that in her for sure but I don't think that that would be her first like right you know tactic oh and you can totally see her going up to like the administration of the school and you know oh yeah so yeah I love that backstory I'm keeping it that's what happened <laughs> love it yes <laughs> thank you <laughs> So she also has this uh, deleted talking head. I'm so sorry. I wanted to no, show it. you this before we moved on because, like, it's so hilarious and it quite it like it really I think is a foreshadowing. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like sometimes they maybe they just like go back in time when they get to the sixth or seventh season and like what's what lines did we say that we didn't pick up on or something that we can really flesh out or mm-hmm. something because she has a deleted scene. It's a talking head where she's talking about her life plan. And I, like, wrote it all out. I, like, transcribed her little monologue. (laughs) But she says, you know, I don't really have a life plan. But, you know, then she goes on to list her life plan where she's like, you know, I'm 34 now. By 35, I will have built a park. By 42, I'll be city manager. By 44, or no, 40, like, 3 or something like this, um, I'll be the department head, which is Ron's job. And then at 44, I'll run for city council, but lose to an uns- unscrupulous, is the vocabulary word she uses, unscrupulous man who's doing cocaine. Oh, my God. <laughs> And then at 50, she'll be the mayor of Pawnee. 60, she'll be the lieutenant governor of Indiana. Then she's governor for a while. And then she's the vice president on the ticket. And then by that time, she realizes that she's 84 years old. And she's like, well, like in her head, she's like, well, I wanted to get married. So maybe I'll get married at 84 to a 30-year-old man. (laughs) (laughs) Which is so specific. That's so specific. I know. I thought it was so cute. Like just adjacent of what actually happened. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's funny, too. You said at... 38 or what what age did you say city manager uh 42 okay and then she goes to department head after that yeah isn't city manager ron's boss oh maybe it would be oh good catch maddie maybe it's 40 is the department head and then 42 is a city manager okay. and then 44 is when she runs for city council that's okay. probably i got i probably mixed that up okay. good job maddie i just want to <laughs> make sure because i was like i was pretty sure that's what chris's title was was city manager Right. No, you're you're completely right. Okay. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just lay this out there for people because the committee is around for a long ass time. The committee mm-hmm. uh, is Anne, Mark, Tom, Leslie, and April. Mm-hmm. So that just so people are aware who's involved. Ron does right, not ever exactly. show up. <laughs> Almost ever. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yes. In fact, sometimes he makes it harder, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say something that I like about, like, we talked about this in the last episode, right? That Mark is kind of the pessimistic version of Leslie, right? Yeah. But I like the way he handles the situation because he's being more realistic than a pessimist, right? She's like, I need to have this forum, like, tomorrow. And he's like, listen, that is not logical. We're not ready to present Mm -hmm. all the facts. And she's, like, gung-ho, which is so in line with Leslie's personality, right? But... He's not discouraging her from having a public forum, which is, I think, what, like, a, the pessimist Mark would do. He's like, let's yeah. slow down. And, you know, so I really liked the way Mark was presented in this situation because I thought he was being logical and a realist for Leslie. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's so true. I agree. Yeah. I'm at the pit now. Yeah, same Z's. 
I also really like when April says, so she's, um, so Leslie is saying, uh, so we're at the pit and Leslie is saying, uh, how many more people have to fall into this pit, uh, until we do something. And she says zero, say it with me. And everyone says zero and April says a (laughs) hundred. And I just really feel like that is such a character thing for April to do. And she does that so much more in the future. Yeah. I, yeah, I think, and I don't know if this is an Aubrey Plaza thing. I don't know if we can find it out, but it seems like they kind of had her pegged pretty early on compared to some of the other characters, you know? Oh, you mean like what her character was going to be like? Yeah. 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 I I agree with you. No, I think that's true. Like she stays pretty much the same, just heightened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does get a little bit more, um, but she also becomes a more balanced character as well. I feel like. Yeah. She starts to care. But yeah, I would be interested to know if that's what that was like a Mike Schur, Greg Daniels choice or if Aubrey was like, this is how I'm playing her. Honestly, you know, or if that was just the writers. Yeah, I think I personally, in my opinion, having seen a bunch of interviews with Aubrey Plaza, it seems as though uh, Mike Schur and Greg Daniels like laid the groundwork, kind of like a blueprint. But she was the one that is kind of I don't know every time I see interviews with her I just feel like she is kind of very similar to April except Mm -hmm. for maybe less mean I don't know her from Adam so maybe she is more mean but I feel like she definitely has that kind of sarcastic like dry like sense of humor but also just way of speaking so I think that a lot of April was Aubrey's choice yeah I can see that because that's true like if anybody goes out there and right listens to an interview with Uh Aubrey like it's kind of hard to draw the line between Aubrey and April. They're very similar yeah. people. Yeah, totally. And I always compare um, the character of April to the character of Angela in The Office because they're kind of like people that you love to hate at some points in the show, even right. though you do love them at the same time. Uh, but Angela is so opposite of in real oh my life. Gosh. Yeah. Like it's I nuts. would be best friends with her. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yes. Yes. And so, but then I was like, but April, I feel from what I've seen of her, she's kind of the same, but like weirder (laughs) (laughs) in a good way in the sense that like, she's really cool and fun, but yeah, she definitely seems like she would have made the choices. Um, I absolutely love that. There's just a lawn chair in the middle of the pit. I know. What the F? Like who's (laughs) chilling down there? Some guys like, you know what? Looks real fun. Sitting yeah. in that pit. I'm going to take the oh lawn chair gosh. down there. <laughs> yeah, what a cool view. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of dirt. Um, I also love that she brought a bo- a single bottle of sunscreen per person, except for Tom. I know. I wrote... <laughs> I know I wrote that exact thing as if they're going to use the whole tube. I also like that she says for your beaks <laughs> <laughs> and that she says, Tom, you probably won't need any. I was like, oh, oh Lord. My gosh. <laughs> yeah, I totally. Also, did you catch? Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. I was just going to say I totally resonate with that, though, because my nose always gets burnt first, like hard. Yeah. Yeah. And if they're going to be outside, it is very smart and practical of Leslie to bring out the sunscreen because it was very sunny. And obviously we see that Anne gets really hot. So I'm sure that it was, you know, a good, sensible choice. It was. (laughs) And sadly, this is not the right time of year for us to be getting a sunscreen ad in here. Otherwise, this would be the perfect spot for it. (laughs) I know it. Tell me about it. Uh, Well, I love that um, I caught, I don't know if you caught this, but I caught that after she hands them the binders, everyone is holding little baggies of something Mm. and I was like okay this must be a deleted scene and guess what it is I have good news for you something that is really fun uh she says that after she passes out the binder she hands out these little baggies and they say good old raisins and peanuts and she calls it gorp (laughs) g-o-r-p for good old raisins and peanuts Oh my gosh. <laughs> and Marx is just gummy bears. And then Anne has a talking head about how Leslie has the energy of a 10 year old. And she like pauses and the same taste in snacks. Yeah. <laughs> which I thought was really hilarious. I love that. And so true. Yes. Accurate. Mm-hmm. I will happily say that I have the, the taste buds of a 10 year old. Yeah. And also, like, I don't know. Gorp is basically just, you know, a uh, trail mix. So next time you yeah. go on a hike, take some Gorp and thank <laughs> Leslie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can we add a C in there somewhere for chocolate? Mmm. Good old raisin gorps. No, gorp. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> How do we do it, Manny? Uh. <laughs> I don't know. This is going to be something I have to contemplate for it yes. to make sense. Because gorp is just so great. 
I don't want to mess it up with adding chocolate. Although I I don't want to eat it without the chocolate. It sounds like something that would be on like Guardians of the Galaxy or like, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gorp. Like Groot. Yeah. What am I thinking? Sorb. Oh, Sorb. Also from Parks and Rec. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. (laughs) (laughs) So true. Uh, I also love that we're foreshadowing like her preparedness with the binders, number one. But number two, that she thinks that maybe a celebrity like Jack Nicholson will be there (laughs) or be in Pawnee. <laughs> oh, I just this is here's my thing. I love her. I feel like this is an aspect of Leslie's personality that you and I both share. We're both preparers, yeah. we're both planners, we're both like how much information can we have about something to make sure that we're prepared. Um and so I love this, right? I love the idea of having a binder. Here's my other thing. How many hours does it take you like this is not a functional use of your time, I feel like, to be that prepared where it's like that's there's like a point zero five percent chance that might happen you know yeah so you're sitting there like oh i love this idea oh wait oh no wait oh that's weird (laughs) i know well and sometimes i think about it when they go on through the show like saying all the stuff that she does to be prepared it's so interesting because i really think and they do touch on it quite a few times actually where whenever i see that i'm like she just must not sleep and it talks about she does say that like how she gets like a solid three or four hours a night or whatever the hell like in order to do all this stuff and i'm like damn if she's getting paid by the hour she's getting screwed over because there's no way they're paying her that much (laughs) my god i hope that she files for some overtime just a little bit to make some of it worth it but that's not what she's in it for but still that's true also the seal is on the binders it makes its appearance again the seal of pawnee i love it so much i love that i'm starting to like fall in love with it because every time i open my mug cabinet there it is (laughs) yay it's the best best. (laughs) also one time i had this uh boss who used those same i don't know if you saw this but i think it's just because i had a little bit of ptsd because i used to have a boss in la that um would carry those little box like the boxes of files and binders and stuff that she was carrying everything in, mm. like with the wheels on the bottom. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had a boss that carried that around and I was like, gross. <laughs> <laughs> Just reminded me of that. Why Everyone need- who worked at that place uh, knows what I'm talking yes. about, but I'll tell you. Like, why do you need that all the time? Why do you need all those right. documents at the same time? <laughs> right. And I would have to like put it in her car sometimes. It was a time. <laughs> uh, Anyways, the past. but yeah. I'm down to the um, suburbanite lady. Yeah, I that's my next note as well. And I, I think, you know, given the rest of the episode, this is a pretty good response, right? She's saying, like, I'm like I'm interested in hearing. I can't go, but I'm interested in hearing, right? And yeah. And Anne is trying to – this is the thing that bothers me. And this is where I am not a Leslie person. <laughs> Anne yes. is trying to relate with this person, right? Which is which goes a long way, and I just I just know that that you know it's going to go a really long way. That you know Anne's going to step up and say, "Hey, I'm in the neighborhood too, and these are the things I feel." And Leslie is like, "No, that's not in the binder." And it's like you know, mm. being prepared, I think, is a really great thing. But when you're going to stop flow of actual human connection, is not a great thing. So. Yeah, that broke my Leslie heart just for like Anne. can't have a normal conversation. I feel yeah. she like has to stick to the binders and the rules and everything. But I, I that's the thing that's the disconnect, which is why it's so great that they're together. But yeah, that's like the disconnect that she's not seeing that like she could get more people at this town hall if she did let Anne like say her experience with it to connect with people like you were saying. Right. Yeah. So I think you know we're losing value there. Because of the preparedness and just kind of the sticklerness of Leslie. That's not a word, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. No, that's a that's a great point. Yeah. Like what is the what is your time worth and what value is that gonna add right. to your project, you know? Yeah, for sure. I have four minutes and forty five seconds is probably one of my favorite interactions in the entire episode. <laughs> it's because oh we have the pedophile park guy. <laughs> Oh my god, uh, creepy AF. Seriously uh, though, like you know, I think the three of them feel like the, I'm talking about Mark, Tom, and April. They feel really mm-hmm. successful, right? Because this guy's interested. And then yeah. he's like, "Is it gonna be like a thousand feet away from my house? Because I really can't move again." And Tom's like, "Uh oh." <laughs> yep. <laughs> so yeah, and he asks about like having um like playgrounds or a pool for the kids maybe, right. and 
you know, then Mark is like, oh, how old are your kids? And he's like, I don't have kids. And that's and when Tom <laughs> says, uh oh. <laughs> Right, 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 right. And then the moving again thing is when Mark says to April, please stand behind right. me, April. So, and yeah. he's like, do you have a flyer or anything? He's nope. like, nope, 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 we don't. You don't, <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, I thought it was handled really well by Mark and, you know, well, I was going to say Tom and April, but they didn't really do anything, right? It was mostly Mark being like kind of ushering the conversation along and being like, all right, well, we're leaving and we're not giving you a flyer and, you know, so. Right. Yeah. I don't know why I don't have his name down. I have the things he's been in. Okay. I have his name. So this is perfect. Okay. <laughs> his this. name okay. is Brian Husky. <laughs> and I know that he was a huge improviser. Uh, and they did a bunch of takes playing around. Um, so does it say what else he's been in? Yes. I have uh, Jurassic World. Mm. Um, Shameless, which is a, a TV show for those of you that don't know. I have not watched a lot of it, but my, my brother watched or watches it religiously. So I've seen a couple episodes. Uh, takes place in Chicago. Chicago. Yeah, it's really good. I haven't there. watched the last, I think, two seasons or something. But the, what I did watch of it, it was really good. Yeah. It's 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 not like Parks and Rec, though. Warning right. people. It's a drama. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then the last m- movie I have him down for is Hotel for Dogs. Did you ever see that? No, I didn't. I heard it was cute, though. Yeah, it was super cute. Yeah, something that's really cool that I kind of noticed, um, and there's a lot of crossover here, and we'll talk about it a little bit later too, but this guy, Brian Husky, that we're talking about right now that plays the pedophile dude uh, is Leon, uh, Leon West in Veep. He plays like this reporter who's kind of out to get the Veep. Um, and something that's really cool is we'll learn that the gal who um, Leslie like takes her anger out on um, that actually ends up coming to the town hall also plays in Veep as the Veep's like right hand gal for like a brief moment. She's not great. She just like agrees with her. Um, but that's really cool. And another side tangent moment note um, thing is that the same casting director is for Veep as well. So you'll see a lot of the same people in the office, Parks and Rec and Veep. Uh, Allison Jones is the most amazing casting director she really has an eye for people who are going to play these characters so well and so memorable um so that's her also it's funny because um allison jones i think um we've talked about this before but just to tell the listener allison jones um not only is really great uh at casting because she has an eye for it but also because she just really loves actors uh i was reading an interview with her or with or maybe I was listening to a podcast I can't remember but uh, I heard that Allison Jones was going to a lot of improv shows and stand up shows and things like that purely because she really enjoys watching performances and she just wants to be around it and it's not I don't think she was going out to those shows to kind of like find the next star or whatever I'm sure she has that in the back of her head somewhere but like she just really enjoys watching people uh, and so I think that that is why you see so many improvisers. Um, mm. Not only are improvisers amazing for these types of shows and commercials and stuff, because you never know what you're going to get thrown on set or like what line reading you're going to have or whatever. But um, it also just makes you a more confident performer, I feel. But, um, but I think that was really cool to learn about uh, Alison Jones is that that's kind of why you see so many improvisers is because she casted them and she loves impro- uh, improv and stand up and comedy in general. But speaking of that, they did a lot of takes with this guy. Like, they did so much. And they talked about how they, like, he had milk in his grocery bags. And they were talking about how he had, like, a vitamin D deficiency. Like, there were all these deleted scenes about, you know, just playing, just making shit up and seeing what worked the best, which I thought was really hilarious. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. I think that's, like, one of the um, beautiful things about Alice and Jones, but also these TV shows is, like, there's magic that can come out of those scenes with improv people that like wouldn't come if you didn't have an improviser. Yeah. And also it's such a teamwork thing too, because there are so Mm. many sets that are so closed in the sense where they don't let you play, uh, where the office and parks and rec are very, very pro improv, like pro finding what 
works and what's the funniest whereas other sets like are so strict on you know what is in the script that you need to stick to kind of thing so and I mean people hear that all the time but especially like having worked on a set that you know is really not me personally but like hearing other people like having worked on sets that uh you know let you improvise and then they go to another show and they're not able to improvise it's like it's such a culture shock so I think it's really cool when you know it's both sides right of that spectrum where like the improvisers are amazing but also they are given the permission to do their thing which just you know it's it's in service to the show which is I think the underlying theme of every one of Greg Daniels and Mike Schur's shows it's like they want to make the best quality product ever it's not about like time or money or whatever it's just like what is the funniest you know right so I yeah, love that for sure I love that also Tom's running again and it's really hilarious <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love Tom Runs. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. I have this line that I absolutely love from uh-huh. Leslie at six minutes when she's talking to uh, this new woman, right, who's uh-huh. going to be in the rest of the episode. I, uh, her name is Lennon Parham is who uh-huh. plays her. Um, and she is also in Veep. Yep. And you said that already. And Arrested Development, Mad oh. Men, and Horrible Bosses too. Um, so she, she's talking to the ladies and being like, well, I just can't come cause I can't get a sitter and I'm going to take care of my kids and I don't really want to park. Right. And Leslie's trying to get her to come. And Leslie says, could the four-year-old watch the two-year-old? <laughs> I know. That's so funny. <laughs> just like, oh, but no, wait, the- you know what? You know what? I just rewatched it. And I thought that that was that same lady too, but there's another, there's another lady. It's not Lennon Parham that she says that to. There's another lady <gasps> that she says that to. What? It's- I know. It's such a weird thing. You guys, go back and watch it. There's three girls. So there's the first gal, uh, and then there's the second gal with the four-year-old and the two-year-old, and then the other one is Lennon Parham. It's so weird. I totally thought it was Lennon Parham, but before I wa- uh, I before we got on today, I just rewatched it, and I was like, oh, shit, there was a third lady in there. Oh, my gosh. I watched that like four times in preparation for this. I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's it's so blended together. I don't know. Yeah, it's dang. It's so crazy. Okay. But no, I love that line too. Can the four-year-old watch the two-year-old? Yeah. <laughs> As if that's a completely normal thing. Obviously, Leslie doesn't have children. Yeah. This is a uh, lovely. There's an old guy at the end of their canvassing. Yes. And I don't know his name, but I saw him and I was like, I know that guy. I mm. 100% know that guy. So I did a lot of like digging around and finally found it. I don't know why I didn't write his name down, but I did a lot of digging around, and he plays Robert Dunder Woo! in The Office. Yes, founder of Dunder Mifflin. Who's this old fart? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's so well, amazing. Yes. He was so good. Apparently, they had a whole deleted scene, scene uh, with him as well, where you know they were talking about that he's been in Pawnee since he was born, and there were cornfields, and like you know the heart of Pawnee was lost when the bread factory burned down, and his dog was there, and all this stuff. It was, uh, I mean, I didn't even see that deleted scene. They were just talking about it on the commentary, but it sounded hilarious. And and yeah, oh they used that guy uh, a lot, I guess, in their in their uh, endeavors. <laughs> you know what I would love to see is I would love for NBC to go back and like get the editors and the producers from like the office and parks and rec and create those like 50 minute episodes that have all the deleted scenes in them. Yeah. You know, I think that I'd love to see that. I would 100% watch that. Yeah. I would. Yeah. Because it would be like a whole new, I don't know if you know this, but Walmart like two years ago was selling um, Harry Potter DVDs like for really cheap. Uh And my brother and I, my brother's been reading through them again and mm-hmm. after he finishes a book, we watch the movie. And so we oh, were yeah. watching uh, Sorcerer's Stone. And all of a sudden, this thing comes up and we're like, "That, that's not in the film. And no all, way! Yeah, all these DVDs have like extra scenes that were taken out. Like not all of the deleted scenes, but a couple of them. So I like yeah. I, it almost makes it feel like you're watching a new movie. So it would be like watching a new TV show almost to like have all those, oh. all those scenes in there. I know, and we talked about this last episode too, where the office is doing is doing that, uh, right. where they're releasing a bunch of deleted scenes and you know bloopers and shit like that. It's oh uh, yeah, that would be so amazing. I would totally watch the hell out of that. Yeah, I would too. I'd be totally about that. Cool, cool, cool. 
Okay, so now I'm back uh, when Tom is running. He goes to be his entrepreneurial self. We're kind of seeing that little glimpse right. with his little douchey headset. <laughs> <laughs> And apparently, according to the commentary, this was another time when they just let a seize roll and improvise. There was a deleted scene uh, where Tom is talking to Leslie on the phone and Leslie's asking, like, you know, how it's going. And Leslie gets off the phone and she's like, just get off the phone with Tom. And he says, it's hard out there for a pimp, but he's going to keep trucking. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That line, though. That's my new motto in life. Yes. Um, And I'm pretty positive. I don't know if this is my favorite. I think it might be actually. When he, this isn't deleted, when he is on his headset and he's talking to somebody, I think it's a sod guy maybe, and he's like, are you going to commit to coming to this meeting tomorrow? Are you going to be a bitch? (laughs) (laughs) That is a great line. Oh, it's so funny. That I feel like we could all use, you know? Yeah, I agree. Versatile. Ugh, so good. I am back at Leslie and Ann. That I didn't have. I yes. just had notes that he he was making some calls about about that stuff. So right, and you do see his. Um, you know, we talked about this last episode a little bit, but we definitely he mentions more than once. Like, well, if you do me this favor, I might do you that favor. So right, yeah, they're definitely trying to paint that picture as well. But yes, I am back at Ann and Leslie's. Um. All right. Well, I love this line, and I feel like we would do this for each other. Maybe not within the first week that we met, but. I love that Leslie, She, the, it's hot outside, and Leslie is like, we should blow in each other's faces. <laughs> Her Anne's face at that is so hilarious. I know. I just, like, as Anne is experiencing who Leslie is, right, just the facial expressions that Rashida Jones has and, yes, you know, just her innocent responses to, like, who is this woman is, it's just oh, so great. Oh, my God. I, uh. Have them now. I guess they're at Lenin Parham, right? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So before that, or I think maybe it's during that, uh, Leslie has this quote, a talking head, where she's saying that you know you have to phrase the question to get the answer you want. This is in the sealed envelope in the binder. Mm -hmm. So essentially, manipulate the other person. And apparently, this is a strategy that she quotes from Karl Rove. For those of you who do not follow politics, aka me, because I looked it up, (laughs) Karl Rove was the former Republican chief of staff, White House political consultant under the Bush administration. Uh, I believe it was George W. Bush, not H.W., but I could be wrong. Regardless, he was in the Bush administration. So, um, yeah, so now they're at Lenin Parham's house or whatever her name is. um, And she is trying to use this strategy uh, by saying something along the lines of, would it make you feel better or worse that a meth head said the same thing? (laughs) She's talking about the barbecue smell, too. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, oh. Yeah. Well, okay. I also, like, I don't really fully understand why this woman doesn't want to park. I know. Um, I don't get it either. I love barbecue smells. Yeah. But I also, like, think she's handling it really well. Like, she's being respectful to Leslie and to Anne. That's true. Right? That's true. <clears throat> like, I don't agree with her. But she's like, you know, like, I just don't, I just don't want one. So if you'll just leave, you know. Yeah. And then yeah. Leslie has to make a choice here that just like oh, where she says, if you don't support this park, you don't love your kids. And it's like, uh, yikes. Leslie, that f- your forum that you're about to have would have gone so smoothly if you hadn't said that because she wouldn't have wanted yeah. to come. You know, I know it just Ugh. and it's also just so inappropriate to say. You know, absolutely. Like you should not tell a mother that she doesn't love her children. That's like awful. Oh my god, I know. Yeah, that was a really heart sinking. Like, oh yikes, moment uh, for me. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely one of those um, key Michael Scott moments when he says something. Oh yeah, and every just everybody just makes the same <sighs> sound. <laughs> yep, cringy, yeah. cringy, cringy. Yeah. Well, and I do have like a bit of a, I mean, this whole thing is basically an Amy Poehler appreciation podcast, but um, not only her, but seeing them two, the, those two gals work together, Lennon Parham and Amy Poehler, apparently, which by the way, Lennon has worked with Amy at UCB, which is Amy Poehler's, um, you know, comedy Upright Citizens Brigade improv troupe that she started, uh, but they've worked together frequently and it shows, I don't know, I mean, yes, I've taken improv, so like, I guess that's where some of this is coming from in acting and stuff like that. 
that. But I think as an audience member, you don't really think about it because they are doing so well. But for me, when I was watching this, it just really reminded me that the more like grounded and truthful you are in your performance it doesn't matter how like fucking crazy your dialogue is or how like shitty your dialogue is or whatever if you keep it grounded and be like keep the character as a real person you can just be so funny Mm -hmm. move the scene along but also make the other person look good too because I feel like those two were just like ping-ponging back and forth on each other of like who's gonna look the cringiest who's gonna look the best like how who's gonna act the best kind of thing and they just had this comedy pitter patter if you will yeah. and it was beautiful to watch I thought yeah I really enjoyed that too I thought it was well done like even though I get frustrated with uh, Lennon's character yeah you know I'm still like it's well done and she portrays the character really well and it's a very consistent character I feel like throughout the episode so. yeah totally as a performance it's like it's yeah. yeah 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 it's really wonderful well we have we have this idea now from Leslie that we're gonna go use Andy mm-hmm. and that that leads us to Ron, who is being told by his his uh, boss, Paul, the city manager, mm-hmm. that he needs to fast track the park thing. Not telling yeah. him. He says, you fast track that park thing, right? And Ron goes, yep. <laughs> um, right, which is another <laughs> kind of like Carl Rove strategy, getting the answer that you want. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and I have information on Paul because he does come up again. Mm. Um, his yes. name is Philip Reeves. Um, he is also on Veep. Da da da. Yes. No surprise there with uh, Allison Jones. Um, also, L.A. Law, Desperate Housewives, Brooklyn Nine Nine, and mm-hmm. The Office. Everyone who is yes! an Office fan, he is Jim's client um, in season four when uh, he goes golfing with Andy and Kevin and the client. I think the episode is literally yes, called it- The Client. Probably. Is it? No, yeah, no, no, and Andy no. has blisties. It's not the it's not the client. The client is uh when he meets up with uh, Tim Meadows at Chili's. That's the name oh, of the episode. Right. But yes, they are okay. they are going golfing and as you say, Andy had the blisties. So <laughs> Yes, and what's his name is from Dartmouth mm-hmm. and it creates a whole little tension moment and it's really great. But yeah. yeah, I love that he is in all three of those shows. Yeah. So again, you know, we're seeing that crossover that we were talking about before too, so yeah. Yeah. Quick question mm-hmm. before we um, talk about him uh, a little bit more. Uh, I-, I was wondering if anyone else had caught this and uh, I believe, did I timestamp it? Oh, yes. Okay. I think it's at 8.58 okay. or you could go to nine minutes too. But it's back when they are, when Ann and Leslie are having that idea to get uh, Andy to come out and, you know, be the cute FDR for their <laughs> campaign canvas. And there is a, se- there, <laughs> there, I don't know if he was a like paid extra or if this just happened he couldn't have been on this set okay let me get to the point so there's this guy that walks behind Anne and Leslie and he's in an arm cast and like but it's like not just a cast it's one of those like plaster casts where you have to I guess they're all plaster Mm -hmm. but like where his arm is like propped up on his like torso with like a rod sticking from his torso cast to his arm cast Mm -hmm. and it's very it's like a split second but I noticed he was walking behind them and I was like what the f like where and why is this guy a thing which also led me to look at the behind the scenes uh, of where they shot this I thought they did a really good job of not getting palm trees in the back they Mm -hmm. got very Indiana looking type Midwestern trees uh, definitely gave me some heartbreak heartache uh, longing for LA because it's just like if you look at the streets and you've lived in LA it's totally such an LA suburb which is really precious uh, I did want to let everyone know that this was shot in a neighborhood near the studio okay so they just went they just took a little detour it wasn't like anything special as far as I know as f- like for finding the location it was just at this like random suburb that was close to this uh, close to the studio okay I'm wondering. But yeah, so like, let me know if you find that cast guy because I don't know what the hell he is doing in there. So since it wasn't a studio, though, could it have just been somebody walking? It could have. I mean, it was near the studio at an in an actual suburb, so maybe it totally maybe it was. You see, like usually when you're an extra, um, they block off a certain amount, like a certain street, and like you can't drive or walk down there. Like they don't let mm-hmm. anyone go on to the set area where they're filming but maybe they opened it up and it's just someone that lives in that area i don't know what happened but i was like what the f is this that's so weird i'm gonna have to look at that so anyway yeah 858 
Um, but anyways, okay, so Paul, yes. But yes, Paul, city manager um, in many other things, and he stops by Ron's office and basically just makes things are, make sure things are running smoothly. And Moving. he wants to, I think his plan is to go to the public forum. Why does he want to fast track it was my question as I was watching I this. I am having a hard time remembering if there was a reason, honestly. I mean, there wasn't a reason that they say in this episode. Uh, Ron does hint at, you know, he has that line of like, you know, the city manager is trying to put new funding into parks and communities and like, you know, a new wind is blowing kind of situation. Mm. So like. He hints at that, but I wonder if is that all there is to the story? Yeah. I don't know. Either way. I don't think we get enough information in the episode to be able to answer that question. <sighs> yeah. Sadly. Um, the Bobby Knight poster is still in Ron's office, so tracking okay. that, just FYI. So we know it made it past the first episode. Yes. Okay. Yes, it did. I think it, I feel like it stays there the whole season, probably. We'll see. That's we'll fair. See. I, I, for some reason, was like, I'm pretty sure that's gone after the first episode, but I, I think you're right. I think it probably lasts the whole first season. Right. And then Leslie's talking head about being a nation of dreamers and like the Russian kids playing uh, was really great. Apparently all those, the Russian like, you know, kids names and um, I was going to say improvisation, which it is, but the uh, imitation is, all, yeah, that's all Amy Poehler. They did not really, they scripted it kind of like as a blueprint, but they didn't really say exactly what she was supposed to say. So she has made up all those names and the imitations and whatnot of the Russian kids and, you know, the swimming in the dirt or the mud or whatever the hell and pretending that a rock is a potato. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I just thought, and they said in the commentary that, I mean, they were really fa fangirling over Amy Poehler because they said that every take they did was different and unique and grounded, and uh, they just got something different every time, which I thought was really, really cool yeah, to hear. that's amazing. I have to say this, there's a line that she says here that is like a tie between another line that would be my favorite, but okay. she's looking at the pit, right? And she says, in Russia, this would be a park. Yeah, which is <laughs> right, right before she goes into that talking right. head. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but we are at Anne's house, right? They're coming back to get Andy and they mm -hmm. walk in. And of course, April, Andy and Mark are playing garage band or guitar hero. One, well, not garage band, rock band or guitar hero. Uh, yeah, rock yeah. band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I love I just I I wanted to go back and track this, but I didn't have a chance to how long Andy goes on after they walk in, right? Because I know they walk in. It was long. Yeah. It's a good amount of time where you're like, how has he not noticed yet? Cause Mark, right. Mark and April have stopped. Right. And I don't know if you've played rock band or guitar hero before, but if you're playing double player, you can see the other person's um, screen on, on the entire TV screen. Right. So mm -hmm. if you're hearing people mess up, you can look over at their screen. So like, why has he not looked over and realized, like, that nobody else is playing? But, yeah, he goes on for a yeah. long, long-ass time. <laughs> so. Yeah, he's just so into it. Um, so he probably doesn't even, like, look at anyone else's screen as long as he's looking at his own. But <laughs> yeah. they did have in the commentary, they said that they had a shot where Andy wasn't singing. But uh, they chose this one of him singing. And so glad because, oh, my gosh, the commitment in that yeah. saying <laughs> or that song holy shit <laughs> also do you know that song i love that song yes please I do know tell me <laughs> <laughs> so a good, good one. and chris pratt has a really nice voice and i think he does a good job of like just going all out totally so, you know, he does have a good voice yeah. i like it too he's having like this moment you're like he's performing exactly as he would for mouse rat he's not like dialing it back for a video game he's like putting everything into this right now yeah so and, I, and then leslie just slams her binder on the ground she's yeah. so mad and the drive back with mark and leslie is so good i mean because think about that choice right they could have just had it that they were back at the office but they chose right. to show us this awkward silence filled car ride <laughs> right so totally. which i wish i love that choice you know i do too i love this um Great spy shot of Leslie and Ron talking, which was when she's sweating through her suit. <laughs> it's just hilarious. <laughs> um, yes. But I really liked this 
shot. I mean, they have lots of spy shots, but I just liked this one because you can kind of see like there's a very, very brief, clear part of the window where the camera goes through. So I really liked that. It was really beautiful to see. Yeah. Um, also, there is a quick commentary moment uh, of a deleted scene also, um, kind of a commentary slash deleted scene like break really fast uh and it's a long one so I'll, I'll i'll narrow it down but basically at this there's a point where ron in a deleted scene tries to get out of the government after he gets the city planner uh you know or after he talks to the city manager he kind of is like okay i'm i'm done with this i don't want to be in here like i've always wanted to upgrade to the private sector which is again is a foreshadowing moment um and then he goes to someone who works in the private sector and talks to them. And the private sector guy is like, we don't have any money in the private sector. Are you kidding me? Like, everything's gone to shit. Like, this is terrible. Uh, at least in the government, like, you have, you know, a set, like, salary and time off and all this stuff. And it was a really great scene. Again, I really wish that they would, you know, publish some of these deleted scenes. But the guy that played this uh, fellow was wonderful. But anyway, uh, so then Ron comes back and has a talking head and he's like, well, you know, that was just a fun conversation between friends. Like, you know, I plan on being in the government for a very long time. And uh, <laughs> his performance is so good. Like when he says that, you can just tell that he's like sick at the thought of himself saying, I'm going to stay in the yeah. government forever. It's, it's so brilliant. Um, so also side note, I do know that the uh, Peacock can probably publish all this, but y'all, if you just get the DVDs, they're like real cheap on Amazon. Then you can see all these things too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got to support. But now I am back at the town hall. Agreed. Um, I am. Yeah. Ready for, I'm ready for the forum. Yes, me too. I yeah. love how Tom is so good at being charismatic um, yeah. and just like trying to woo all of these like contractors and everything. I love his line of, you know, some people say this like is jumping the gun, bringing contractors in so soon. But here's a gun. Here's me. Boom. And he like jumps on top <laughs> of the gun. Uh, quick commentary note again. Sorry about all the commentary notes, but you guys, it's really amazing. Basically, all of these contractors in this town hall were extras. They don't have lines. You'll notice that. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. So Tom had this kind of challenge for himself that he told the producers that he was trying to get all these extras to break. And all the extras, if you've ever been an extra before, you are basically a human prop. Like you are not supposed to react too much. You're not supposed to be too over the top. You're not supposed to like really like take note be taken notice of you know you're just supposed to be there as a background obviously and be very realistic very grounded uh and so we have been trained extras have been trained to not be too over the top and so tom would like try to fuck with them and get them to be over the top <laughs> And so he, this guy, though, when he says, I can't remember which one. It was like the last one that he talks to. He was that was the one where he was like, this is the last extra. I really got to like make them break. And they just like didn't. And it was it's just so funny. That's amazing. I'll have to yeah, go back just, and watch that scene now. You totally should. I mean, I can't believe that they that they were all extras, you know? Yeah. No, that's crazy. It's wild. and so cool. Don Cement, the best you can get. Yeah. Don <laughs> <laughs> I love all of Tom's jingles. I'm pretty positive that was also improvised. Many of his jingles are improvised. Yeah. So that was uh, good on you, Aziz, for coming up with that. Yeah, for <laughs> so sure. So funny. I think this also gives us a redeeming quality in Tom, right? We're like, okay, he's good at something. He's here for a reason to mm -hmm. kind of practice these skills rather than just be a sleazeball. Yeah, 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 so. yeah, yeah. And he's using his personality to try to, you know, better something, even if it is just trying to, like, get his, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of thing. Like, it's right. nice to see that everybody can kind of bring their own personality and tactics to the table. Yeah. I um, I have a really big problem here with Leslie's mom. Yeah? Because, you know, she's like, I always tell Leslie that it's okay to be a <gasps> mom or a wife. Right? Because she's like, I want her to be successful. So I told her it's always okay to be, a like, a mom and a wife. And I just, like... Heartbreaking. Can, like, I, I have problems with this both ways. Firstly, because it insinuates that being a mom and a wife is easy, is the easy way out. Which I'm sure if there are moms listening, you know that's not the case. Ugh. Right? It's, it's work if you stay home. It's work if you go to work. Right. It's just what it is. You know, it's not an easy choice. Right. So she's almost looking down on that as a 
as a choice, right? Right. So, I mean, I just have a, you know, I just have a problem with that. And then she also is showing she doesn't really have faith in her daughter to succeed in the dream she has, Mm -hmm. which, which breaks my heart because I know that your mom and my mom have been so great with us about finding our dream and being supportive and always being like, how can I help? And vent to me about this. And, you know, like, I know that that's just so characteristic of our moms that I can't imagine like my mom being like, you know, it's okay if you just stay home. I know. know? I know. And it's it's like that weird backhanded compliment too of like, you know, you're really good at other stuff, but like that, what they're saying that you're good at isn't seen as good, if that makes sense. So yeah, Mm -hmm. just totally agreeing with you there. Um, I have something on a performance level that is really interesting. And I like, my jaw was on the floor when I heard this in the commentary. Pamela Reed improvised that line. Of, oh my gosh. I want my daughter to be successful. That's why I always tell her there's nothing wrong with being a wife and mother. She said this in the casting uh, session that when she was, she like wasn't even cast yet. Seth Gordon, the director who was in the casting room, like we talked about earlier. Um, and this was one of those lines that she said. And so they wow. wrote it into the show. Uh, and it turns out some like this is not surprising at all. But it turns out that that was something that had actually been said to her by her father-in-law, which oh is gosh. shitty on a whole other level and not surprising. Mm-hmm. But she proudly told him, according to the commentary, that she used that line to get this job. So <laughs> <laughs> suck it, father-in-law. <laughs> yeah, damn. Like, that's so ballsy. Crazy. Like, your mom knows you on a different level, but, like, your husband's dad? That's How could like, you say that? Damn. Ooh. Yeah, and I, I do think that when a dude says it, like, absolutely it was that implication of, like, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a woman uh, as a mother and a wife. Like, you can be successful at that as if it's not something that, that – it, oh, my God, I'm not going to explain it. It's just, like, make, yeah, something to be yeah. proud of. It's, it's gnarly. But, yeah, so uh, I love that she turned that on its head and – it's just like so layered and it, it made yeah. you hate her in the best way. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the thing is though, going back to the very first scene in the episode, mm-hmm. she did show up at least. Yeah, that's true. You know, and by the end you nice do things. see that she like raises her eyebrows and a bit of a smirk to be like, okay, well you got through it. So that's something, right. you know, and that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think that this line is intended to be like mega super cruel or like take the life out of Leslie. I think mm-hmm. that she's saying it like many men are in some sort of like, this is supposed to build you up, but you're just making the other person feel small, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, um, I, I do like seeing that evolution of her being at the meeting and then kind of like, you know, when she filibusters her own meeting, she gives that smart, the Marlene gives that little smirk of like, okay, well you did it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, also found a way around it. (laughs) Exactly. The city planner comes up to Leslie before she starts and says, Hey Leslie, I want you to nail this. So much pressure. I was like, what the heck? And it's not like it's, if, if Ron said it, it wouldn't mean the same thing. Right. But this is like the right. supervisor above her supervisor. And it's like, that's right. really nerve wracking. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> I love that she's thinking about pulling the fire alarm. Oh, my gosh. That's illegal. <laughs> it's, yeah, super not allowed to do that. Which I have a story of that happening to me. No way. Tell me. Yeah. So I was in the fourth grade and I went to fourth. I attended fourth grade in the United States in Illinois. And we had um, this big thing in fourth grade where you were assigned a historical figure from the United States Uh and you had to do all this research you had to buy it put together a costume of what you they would have worn based on where they were from or and what year they were alive in and all that stuff and then you had to give a presentation and it was in this big auditorium I think the gym maybe and so like you have like a hundred and something kids in there that are standing up to go give this presentation and a high schooler pulled the fire alarm in the middle of someone's speech and so all the parents and all the kids had to to single file out of the school to just find out there was no fire we all thought there was a fire of course and we found out later it was a high schooler that had was in there and pulled it was it one of those ones where the sprinklers come on too or no if it was i don't remember because i don't remember getting wet okay i just remember good. it being really loud 
in the middle of a speech though in that's so scary and like how do you come back from that oh my god oh i know and we had to single file back into the auditorium and <gasps> had to finish oh my god did they find the person who did it i'm sure they did oh yeah, yeah. i'm sure yeah because they knew right away it was a high schooler because th- i mean it was at night so it wasn't a school full of kids there were a couple of people on campus so right right oh my yeah. god that's so wild but, yeah wow. don't pull the fire alarm kids <laughs> right <laughs> it is illegal yeah you will get in trouble there is lawrence shows up here have we talked about lawrence mm-hmm. i don't episode. think so no? i think this is our first time hearing from him eric edelstein yeah I, that's i have him now i don't have anything he's been in though written down i don't think he's really been in anything it says he's known for Jurassic World. I don't know what he did in Jurassic Nor World. He was a paddock supervisor. Don't know what that means. Um, Alexander and the Terrible, something called Horrible. The Hills Have Eyes 2. Oh, people have seen that. Gross. <laughs> a show called Hoops. Uh, yeah. He was in the TV show um, Twin Peaks as Detective Smiley Fusco. Okay. Well, anyway, so yeah, that is him. <laughs> Perfect. Well, he he comes back. He's a reoccurring character as well. And um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he's there to yell at Andy. <laughs> he gets to <laughs> yes. sit on the stage. You have birds now? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just love uh, that that relationship grows, right? Because almost every time we see Lawrence, he's interacting with Andy. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, it's beautiful. I laughed out loud when Andy's band is called Just the Tip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I so totally good. forgot about all the fucking band names that he has. It's so hilarious. I know. It's so good. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> and I love how it transforms through the show. Uh, and then I also love that um, Leslie is talking about, you know, well, she's, you know, saying that Mark is like the leader or whatever of this. And then she, he takes over speaking. Like, do you want me to say something? And then she's just like so smitten with him. It's so wild. But apparently mm-hmm. all of the talking of, of like, you know, congratulations on getting to hear him speak and like he's the best ever that was all improvised by amy poehler as well and him wow. reacting of like laughing along is all real <laughs> wow yeah. that's crazy oh, it's nuts she's so good i know i love her i love her <laughs> i love i can't remember who says this but someone comes to realize that she's filibustering and I can't remember. I, I, can't I think remember it's Paul it's that says. Paul. Yeah, I think it's okay. Paul that says like she's filibustering yeah. her own she's meeting. She's filibustering her own meeting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's like, what the heck is going on? Yeah. And I think oh it's really gosh. funny, too, that they showed this because this is, you know, one of those times when they researched the show uh, and the producers talked to a lot of people in local government. And they definitely said that this was very accurate, very indicative of a town hall in real life where people really only go to town halls or, you know, talk about something in the government if they don't like it you know so it's like a lot of these people that are actually in support of a park or in support of a good project will not come because they're like well that's great that's awesome if it comes but the people that you know disagree strongly with whatever the meeting is about are the ones that show up and that's kind of you know that's where we've got to be better I feel um as far as just like being a human being in general. Um, but right. especially in our government, especially local government, it's so important. Um, but I thought that that was kind of heartbreaking to like read that and just like be reminded yeah. that, you know, so many people that don't like something are the ones that are going to stop it, obviously. So the people that do like it, you got to go. And it is hard, I will say, because I have looked up um, a couple of town hall meetings that I would have loved to gone to, uh, not last year because of COVID, but um you know, when I first moved here and some of these town halls are so stupid. They're like at, you know, 2 p.m. or like 11 a.m. on a fucking weekday. And I'm like, what do the people do that have to work? I don't understand right. how you could possibly get like any insight into what the community is actually feeling when we're when, when like 90 percent of your community is not able to attend anyway. You know, right. Yeah. Sorry, I just went on a soapbox. It's frustrating. But it happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's good. It's a good thing to talk about. Yeah. Um, oh, the filibuster. I know what I was going to bring up for you. I'm sorry. I wrote something about it. So um, Alan Yang, who plays the bass player in Andy's band, is also a writer mm-hmm. in the show. He also co-created um, Master of None with a C's on Sorry. And he had he was the one that had the idea for the filibustering her own meeting. So shout out to Alan Yang. I just wanted to tell you that because you yeah. mentioned it. Nice. That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's really cool. I have 
my last note, but you, I remember we've talked about this and I think you say it so eloquently. So I'd like you to that last moment when I think it's Lawrence that's walking away, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he says something so like rude to Leslie, but like you explain that because we've talked about it, but it's just, it's beautiful. But like, I think you say it much better than I do. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so yeah. So at the end, she's having this talking head. She's done filibustering her meeting. Um, and she's like, okay, we got to wrap it up. It's 9 PM. And he walks out and, uh, Lawrence says, Hey park lady. And Leslie's like, you know, yeah. And he's like, you suck. And then she turns back to camera and says, you hear that? Called me park lady. (laughs) (laughs) And and also bonus. uh, Guess what, Maddie, about that line? Was it improv? Yes. Uh, (laughs) They just kept the cameras on and Amy Poehler turns back to camera and is like, called me park lady. (laughs) This is so fucking brilliant. I don't know how she does it. I know. That's so good. And I just love the positivity, right? Like. I mean, it's not the, like, the most creative, you know, right. thing to say to somebody. You suck. But, you know, she takes it as, oh, he called me park lady. I know. You know? And he and she's like, you know, she just loves it. She loves every minute of her job. And I think if you're not looking at it the way she looks at it, like, you can be pretty miserable. So I think, you know, it might be, some people might see it as naive. But I think it's also, like, beautiful that she can see the beauty like the see the cool things about it like oh now I'm park lady yeah you know? exactly exactly now that she, now she's known for something <laughs> right I also exactly. love that when Mark is explaining the park he says it's a, a rectangular lot and um, <laughs> it has excellent so drainage <laughs> the most boring parts of the park <laughs> right which I think is a representation of how he feels about his job right mm. he thought mm. he was going to be doing something much bigger but he's really just drawing squares and that is tangles. so true. What a wonderful so, similarity. Yeah. I also noticed um, in this town hall moment the shakiness of the camera. Like it was really following mm. everyone going back and forth. And I really loved that because, I, I mean, we saw that kind of sort of in the first episode. But this one was awesome because it was so documentary style and so its own character so I liked that that they were making sure they caught all the movement Um, and speaking of that when they were going back and forth between Andy and Lawrence evidently when they were fighting and like spatting and at each other or whatever this was one of those improv moments too where they were just riffing off of each other they had so many takes evidently where you know first it was about the birds then it was about (laughs) something else like but and so I think that was kind of up to Mike Schur and Greg Daniels obviously but Dean Holland our superstar editor uh, who also is a producer on the show um he kind of has i guess uh a say in what stays because he sees the takes and which one's the best um but uh, i also i'm just coming i'm thinking of all these things that are making me laugh but one of the things too with that was cut out and i wish that they didn't cut it out was where ron says that you know after leslie's trying to avoid the vote by saying like okay i want to hear everybody um he says Heart of a mule, this woman, about <laughs> Leslie. I thought that was hilarious. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. I want to have that on a t-shirt. Heart of a mule. Yeah. <laughs> I am, um, th- on the, the note that you have about, like, the improv with Andy and Lawrence, uh-huh. I think we're going to find the further we go into this um, podcast and the further we get into the series, how good Chris Pratt really is at improv. Because right. I don't think people know him from improv. But when you kind of delve into the show, you're like, oh, my gosh, he could do improv. No problem. Yeah. His comedy timing is is out of this world. Yeah, it is. It's great. Mm -hmm. So this is um, I have this note that says this book is awesome. Oh, yeah. It's the one that she starts to read when she is trying to filibuster her own meeting, as we've said. Uh, It's what is it? The Phantom Tollbooth? Shit. What is it? It could be. That sounds right to me. Oh, no, it is the Phantom Tollbooth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Look at you. Okay. Phantom Tollbooth. Okay, so yes, she's reading the Phantom Tollbooth. Um, it's a great book. But what I wanted to tell you also was that when she talks about the history on Pawnee and how she keeps going on and on so that she doesn't have to take the vote or anything like that, She, I did a deep, bit of a deep dive because she talks about how Pawnee was founded in 1817, Indiana was in 1816, which was on the seal, 
And they talked about how Pawnee was founded by Reverend Luther Howell, who came from Terre Haute on an ox and was met soon after by an angry tribe of Wamapoke Indians when seeing the whiteness of his skin twisted him to death. <laughs> and so I did a bit of a deep dive <laughs> to find out if the Wamapoke Indians were real. And I can't find anything to say that they were actually a real tribe, but there mm. is a website, the Wamapoke anyway. So if there, if that is real and I'm, you know... If that's a Native American tribe and you guys know that, then please let me know because I couldn't find anything. Uh, but there is a website called PawneeIndiana.com. And for a second, I was really confused. I was like, wait, did we overlook that there was an actual real life Pawnee, right. Indiana? Uh, but it's literally a website for the TV show. They, so <laughs> they have city council bios. They have a little Sebastian Memorial site on the website. Um, do you want to hear some stats on Pawnee? Yes, I really do. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's so specific. It's wild. Okay, so it says that its population is 79,218 people based on the 2000 census. So detailed. Again. They have and not done that in a long ass time. I know. <laughs> um, Get on it. Yeah. Um, If you look at a map of Pawnee, it's actually the map of Muncie, but upside down and flipped. And you okay. can kind of see similarities, but that's where they get that map. That's one stat. The other stat, okay, the racial makeup. Oh, Lord, here we go. 89% is white. Okay. Big surprise, not really. 8% African American, 1% Hispanic, 1% Asian, and 1% miscellaneous, quote. What? Uh, I'm guessing that just means everyone else that they couldn't identify. I don't know. The highest uh, elevation point is the Larry Bird Municipal Landfill. Larry Bird. What up? We talked about him last nice. episode. Also a tall person, so that makes mm, sense. Mm -hmm. Well, but wait, what do you mean? Because it's the landfill that was the highest elevation. Did you think that it, um, I meant like the highest, like the height? Yeah. Of yeah, him? we'll just cut that out. <laughs> no, like I meant like the, the height of, I thought you meant it was like the highest point in Pawnee. And I was like, well, that makes sense because he's like the tallest person probably from Indiana or whatever. Oh. Uh Oh my god, I totally understand what you're saying now. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. We yeah, well, okay. Um, do you want to hear what the official city bird is? I really do. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to say, like, no, I don't need it. I'm gonna be am I gonna be surprised? It mm -hmm. is. I always want to know the bird. Oh my god, it's so exciting for me because it's called the giant grizzled neck cackling pigeon. It's a pigeon. <laughs> Holla. <laughs> It's my pigeon yes. time. Does it is that an actual bird? Did you Google it? Cackling pigeon. I did not Google it. Let's do it now. God. No. It, well, wait. Cackling geese and pigeons in the city parking lot <laughs> is something. But the third link is literally a Pawnee, uh, Indiana, like from Parks okay. and Rec. So, so I'm pretty positive fake. that was made specifically for the show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, definitely. But it's a pigeon, and that's exciting. Um, also, this is a random thing. I'm just coming up with random little things, but she was drinking a Gatorade or a Powerade or something before, and then at the end of the scene, she has a water, so I'm pretty positive she's really nervous and just drinking a lot. Or yeah. that was a continuity error, and right. they just have multiple things that she's drinking. Oh, April comes in and says that she is a youth in the community. I thought that that was really hilarious. I love that line. It's so funny. Um, and then, yeah, now we're at the park lady, uh, line and, um, there is something also, I don't know if this was Lawrence throwing it or who did it, but somebody threw something at her or at the stage and it didn't get close to the stage, but you know, it was what it was. <laughs> and then the park lady, uh, line happens. There was intention behind it. Somebody meant to throw it. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um, and then, yeah, I, 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 what did you think about this tag scene? Because I personally did not think it was their best. So then I was like, I wonder if they just were cut for time or what was going on. And it turns out that that's exactly what happened because uh, they only had six seconds left. Um, and so they just decided to throw a season there. <laughs> but yeah, this book mm. is awesome. <laughs> you know, you know what it reminds me mm. of is um, there's that tag scene on launch party in the office when Ryan just comes up to the webcam and he winks at it mm. and then he walks away, I'm like, was that necessary? Or like, they just needed to fill time, I guess. And that's kind of how I feel about this tag. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what it was. 
Yeah. But I, I, lo- I love that line. This book is awesome. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. So good. Well, that are oh, that yeah. ends my episode two of canvassing. Same. So we are we have completed our second episode. Oh my gosh, we're on the move, you guys. Well, again, uh, yes. follow us on Instagram. Send us a direct message if you want us to Google something or um, not Google something because you guys could obviously Google something. But if you want yeah. me to research, like, right, research deeper or see if they had a deleted scene or a commentary moment about it, then just let me know because or let us know because we are monitoring. We also have an email parkpalspodcast at gmail dot com, uh, but you can just find us on Instagram. That'll be that'll be good. Uh, and then we'll also, Maddie, did you say what your favorite line of this show was? Yeah, I liked the Russian part. In Russia, this would be a park. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So that's that one. Uh, and then mine this time was: uh, Are you going to commit to coming to this meeting, or are you going to be a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> So put your votes in for that um, on our social media, or you can also do a write-in because we allow that. We'll see what mm-hmm. wins for episode two. And of that course, true. join us next week for season one, episode three, The Reporter, where we'll meet even more. Even more yeah, cameos more and new meet, people. More new people. We're building the city for sure. Well, thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to hearing. I was about to say seeing, but then I was like, well, you're not going <laughs> to see us. So, oh, God. Okay, it's getting that time. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Parking some pals, and there's also therapy too. All right, therapy time. Yay, therapy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, where do you want to start? Like, what have you been doing? Should we talk about what you've been doing the last week? Let's talk about it. I have been um, in Phoenix, Arizona for training for my new job. Yeah, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if we keep any of the uh, audio from therapy from other uh, episodes Mm -hmm. we will find that Maddie was once a teacher Mm -hmm. Maddie was not in a great place as a teacher Mm -hmm. so um, I am back doing therapy so I'm initially I was a music therapist with a certification in neurologic music therapy so I am very excited to be able to use that again and I will be working with kids with autism and um, like just with high needs and Um, so I'm really excited to start that work again. So I've been in training, kind of learning what that job is and, um, preparing for the upcoming weeks of starting to get my clients. So it's very exciting. Can you, can you say that story that you were telling me though, about like not using I, because I think that that's really interesting and something that I don't think audiences like understand or even know, you know what I mean? Like I I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. And, um, those of you that are listening that are, are counselors or any type of therapist, um, it was drilled pretty hard in my training that you don't use the word I in your treatment plans, in your paperwork, because that leaves up the opportunity for you to bring emotions into your documentation. And that doesn't really support what you're working on. Um, also, like they really frown upon you saying anything like she felt she was irritated when they didn't say that. You can't just infer that from how people behave. Mm-hmm. Um so like it's very strict writing um and I got really in a groove with it when I was a therapist before and I thought like I feel like I got really good at it and I was really confident in my paperwork writing um and I was in training today and they're like all right so in this first section of paperwork you're gonna write I taught this Mm -hmm. I did this and so yeah my brain is a little bit fried right now just Mm -hmm. trying to like reconnect the wires of it's okay for you to say I it's okay for you because I literally stared at a blank um, like paperwork form mm-hmm. for like five minutes. Like, how do I word it if I'm allowed to say this? <laughs> like, yeah. Well, and know. so is that something that is different because of the like company or like, why can you say I now? I think it's a company thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it it's like, it sounds like, like it's a specific section that you're allowed to do that. It's not like it's all of your documentation or you can just like weave that in. Right. Or can you? Well, so, so I, you can use I in any paperwork, it sounds like. Just the first section of our paperwork is you talk about yourself, and then the other section is you talk about um, the client or mm. the person. So that's another thing they don't like is client. They don't like that word, which oh. I was always trained you say client. What um, do they prefer? Like patient? They want – no, because if you're working in a medical setting, so like when I did my practicum at MGH in Boston uh-huh. – you would, I typically would say patient because they're a patient at the hospital. Right. Um, 
but they they feel like it's very impersonal mm. um so they want us to re- refer to them as an individual or you know he she um you know they. this you know the student yeah it's just um they don't want you to use client, which I, I understand where they're coming from. It's mm-hmm. just weird for me coming from like this very strict um, yeah. form of writing. It so. sounds like they're trying to have some kind of like fusion between, you know, being clinical and personal. Right. And I think partially that's because, and this is true of any place that you go, right? But at any time you can request your paperwork. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if I, I went to my therapist and said, I need all the notes that you've taken on our sessions. They have to give it to me. Like, there's a process, obviously, but I have a right to my documentation. Interesting. Okay, I didn't know that. Oh, my God. I do not want to see what my therapist says about me. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I they're mean, taught that. I would probably be great, but whatever. Right? They're, t- they're taught that. that y- you have to rem- remember that your, your client, your person, could always ask for it Mm -hmm. so you know you have to think about that because they can also be i mean especially in in our work your paperwork can be mandated in court it can be subpoenaed wow so that's another reason you have to be that was my old job too it could have been subpoenaed or um so you have to be kind of also careful i mean not like you're going to say anything bad about the client but you have to think about that stuff like yeah um you know somebody else is going to read this yeah. And it's not just going to be me. Like, I have to be very mindful about how things are said and worded and, um, you know, so also so that it makes sense, right? So when I was a therapist, um, like at my job before teaching, um, there are words that I would use to explain behaviors or um, just like, for, exa- for an example, would be like, in order to as- address his vestibular system, Mm-hmm. In parentheses, I would explain what the vestibular system is because if you send that out and to the parents, like let's say the parents want to see the documentation. Yeah, they don't know what that means. Not every parent is going to know. Right. Not every parent's going to know know that. Um, I mean, a lawyer's not going to know what that means. Um, well, that's so tricky know. too because it's almost like you have kind of like a, a wall that you have to like balance on because, you know, you mm-hmm. want to be like, again, that fusing of clinical and personal, but also like. I don't know. Is it always in the back of your head that you're like, well, a lawyer might look at this in court one day. Do you ever think about that or do you kind of just try to get the job done? No, I think, I mean, like, as I said, like I, I came to love this aspect of the job. Like I love documentation. I don't honestly Mm -hmm. think too much about it because I've probably put over 10,000 hours in of documentation. So it's kind of just become second nature to me of, um, this is my process. After a session, I have a post-it note ready because you don't always have time after mm-hmm. a session to sit and do your document documentation to the best of your ability. So I have a post-it note right. with like the key things that I have to, I really, really think are very important to outline in my documentation. And then at the end of the day, I sit and I make sure I get those key points in. And really what I'm trying to show is that our session had my client leaving in a better space than when they walked in. Mm. And that could literally mean they showed up crying and they left not crying, you know, right, like, right, right, right. I mean, we could have gotten maybe nothing accomplished, but that's kind yeah. of the story I'm trying to tell. And I think just over time I came, I got into a lingo. I had my own vernacular that I, you know, was set in and right. it would come across as professional. I mean, it takes work. Like I didn't just sit down. I was like, I'm amazing at this, you know, like, right, like right, I, right, it takes right. work and, you know, they make it part of your training to, you know, get um, to, to have all your professors look over your writing and whatnot too. So, um, Mm -hmm. well, that seems kind of tricky sometimes too, because I feel like, you know, the common like theory behind therapy is like, you're going to feel better after therapy, but like there's Mm -hmm. so many times when you don't, you know what I mean? But maybe it's different also with like autism and other like disorders that you're talking about, because like for, for me, I know sometimes after therapy, most of the time I do feel better, but there are times when I'm like, you know, sometimes you're rehashing like a painful thing. And Mm -hmm. then like after it's not like, it just takes a minute, you know what I mean? To, to get better instead of just like leaving feeling like, you know, more uplifted. So that's, that's tricky. Yeah. I think it's true of all therapies. Cause I think back to when I was in physical therapy last year for my elbow, right. Mm -hmm. I was in so much pain. Oh my gosh. Right. (laughs) I was in so much pain when I would leave the, the physical therapy office sometimes just because they worked the muscles so hard and they were trying to get the arm straight again. And, but then like three days later, I'd be able to straighten my arm better. 
So you're working Mm. those muscles and it's not going to feel good, but you know, in the long run, you're going to feel better. And I, I think this, this, the thing is there are so few things, at least that I've treated that are curable. Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. Autism is not curable. Is that a problem? No. Because you can give and provide the skills and resources to be successful without yeah. being cured. But that's yeah. the thing is like you're not looking to go into therapy and be cured when you walk out. You know, right, right, you're right, looking right. to leave with a skill and, mm. um, you know, whether it's confidence, patience, teamwork, you know, you're looking yeah. to just leave with something that you didn't have when you got there, I think. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's really awesome. So. Well, I'm just like so happy that you're like in a job that you actually really love and are passionate about and you're finding that even in the training, it's like really something that you're into. So yeah. you've waited so long. I know. I just, I feel, I feel like a different person almost. Like I feel like I have more energy mm-hmm. and I'm more excited. <laughs> like all I the mean, time. you're spending so much time. I mean, doing like our day jobs, our full-time jobs, you spend mm-hmm. more time there than you do at home or with right. your loved ones, which is gnarly to think about. But like, that's what we do. That's our yeah. culture. So it's like, it takes a toll. It does. Yeah. So if you're doing something that's like dragging you down, it, it really, I think it makes a bigger impact than I think we realize. So mm-hmm. um, I feel very blessed that I was presented with an opportunity. Um, shout out to my friend, Laura, who told me about the job. Um, Yay! But, go Laura. Yeah, it just it just, you know, I think it's it makes a huge difference. So I'm I'm excited. And I've I'm like Holly has literally been here every step of the way. Every complaint I've ever had. I called her when I when I quit. I called her when I got the job. <laughs> I was like, okay. Oh, I'm so honored <laughs> to be on this journey to see it come to fruition. It's so lovely. You're literally my wife, so you could not know. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. We are married. Who's to yes. say we should have a ceremony, Maddie. <laughs> I am not kidding. We should do that. When we go to Hawaii, we'll have a little ceremony on the beach. Oh, my God. That would be so beautiful. I'd be so yes. into it. Me too. <laughs> oh, my God. Amazing. All right. Well, okay. Holly has some uh, some fun things that you did this week, too, huh? Yeah. So... I want to hear all about it. Okay. I'll tell you everything. Um, <laughs> so last week I'll, I'll keep it short ish, but you know, I'll tell you, but last weekend I went up to Pigeon Forge, um, to audition for Dollywood, hoot, 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 um, yes. which <laughs> we love Dolly. We love Dolly, Saint Dolly, goddess queen, um, patron saint of everything. <laughs> um, yeah, so I audition every year. This is my third year auditioning. Uh, it's really interesting kind of like the, I guess evolution it's taken because this time I literally just went to have fun because I hadn't sang or auditioned in person for over a year with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, All of my auditions are usually, um, you know, on, on like virtual anyway, like I send in a self tape, but like for theater and stuff like this is, they're all in person and we theater's not a thing this last year. So um, we went in person, we were masked and distanced, um, so like for the dance call, we had we had to wear our masks, and it was oh it was wild. I mean it's just like this new world that we're living in because um, after she taught us like you know eight counts or whatever, she'd be like okay go ahead and just go to the side take out like take your mask down for a brief moment and like breathe, um, and so we would like all separate really really far away, um, and we weren't in there for very long. So you know and then when we were singing, we we could take off our mask, but we were like more than six feet away. From from the audition table where the audition uh, judges were masked. So that was nice. Um, but yeah, and uh, we always stay at the Dream More Resort there because for auditioners, and um, they say this, so I think it's common knowledge, but um, or it should be anyway, that when you audition, if you're auditioning, you can get a discount. Um, so at the resort, so I always just stay there and my mom will come down because it's like six hours from her and four hours from me. So it's like a nice little moment. Um But yeah, I mean, it was a really fun audition. And like I said, it's just so fascinating because the first year I did it, I was so nervous and I was just so like, it was my dream thing. I, I wanted it so badly. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a call back and then didn't hear, or, oh, well, they're actually really great. And they tell you if you don't get it like via email or letter or whatever, I can't remember. I think they send a letter. 
um, which is like unheard of for auditions. If you don't get right. it, you don't hear from them. So that was really nice that they tell you either way. Um, and then the next year we went, my mom, my sister and I went to Dollywood, uh, the theme park. Cause I had never been actually, I had seen videos and everything, but I'd never actually been to the theme park. And so we went and we saw a few shows and I like them a lot. I think they're really fun. Uh, I really want to see the Christmas shows, uh, as well. But the show that we saw wasn't actually like a theater show in the sense where there is like a book and then music to support the book. It was more of like a review with a few lines sprinkled in to like marry them together, which I love. Mm -hmm. Um, But then, so the second audition, I wasn't as nervous. I still really wanted it, but I wasn't as nervous because I was like, you know, if I get this, it'd be really great. I'd love it. Um, But it wouldn't like hurt my feelings if I didn't get it. So I got a call back both of those years and didn't get it. And so this time, literally, I was just like, I haven't auditioned for something in one more than one whole year. So I'm just going to get my ass up there. Number one. And number two, I love, 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 love the buffet at the (laughs) Dream More Resort. (laughs) It is one of my most favorite places to eat in the entire world. Her fried chicken is so good. She has this thing called stone soup, which is a really beautiful thing that her mom used to do um, because they were really poor growing up. Uh, And so she would make, her mom would make this vegetable soup and it was like, just like bunches of, you know, veggies and stuff from their garden that wasn't really like super special, but her mom would tell her to go out and get a stone from the um, grass or wherever they were at their house. And like she, the mom, like all of the kids picked a stone and then the mom would choose the stone to put in the bottom of the soup. And like that stone was like really special and it was like, it meant a lot. And that would go at the bottom of the pan for the soup and like she'd wash it and clean it and everything. And it just made like, you know, when you're poor, I feel, or just in general, when you have kids, I think too, like you make something really special, um, to a kid that, you know, Mm. as an adult, you're like, Oh, well it's not really that special, but it is. So, so she brought that to her buffet And, um, so my mom and I had some things there and then we just hung out. Um, the hot tub was still open, which was, I don't know how they could do that, but like there was no one in there really. So, um, we felt fine going in there, uh, I guess with the chlorine, maybe it's not as bad. And everybody was really good about wearing masks at during at the, at Dollywood, but Maddie, oh my gosh. And I feel like weird maybe saying this because I don't know who all is listening, but I'm going to say it anyways. We went to Gatlinburg to drive down through Gatlinburg, and I was appalled at the lack of masks. It was astonishing. And I was like, I honestly, it, it's, I, I feel weird saying it, I guess, but like there was a part of me that was, number one, scared. Like I actually mm-hmm. felt like an anxiety, like fear for my life, not having right. other people wear masks. But number two, I almost wanted to cry. Like I started like getting really emotionally like sad because people are s- being so selfish and not caring about their fellow person and not wanting to wear a mask. And like we went inside cause we had to wait for our table. And so we went somewhere to just like hang out, um, to wait for our table for a brief moment and like look around and people were coming in there with no masks on. And I was like, you're inside. Like I can want kind of sort of see it if you're outside. Um, right. because, uh, but not really in Gatlinburg because there's so many people everywhere. So like, even if you are outside, you should probably wear a mask cause you're going to be, you know, passing by people very closely. But regardless, I was just like, it almost made me just want to burst into tears right there because I was like, no one cares. And it's that whole thing of like, if you, it's not, the pandemic is not over because you're over it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So anyway, but, um, that's a whole other tangent, but I will say that the audition was really fun. They were really warm. They had me read something for, um, the Christmas shows, which was really sweet. Um, I didn't do that in my other two auditions. So, um, I got to read for a mom. I always read for a mom, (laughs) which it's fine. I'm not mad about that, but, um, I've never read for the Christmas show. They also had us sing, um, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Um, which was fun. And um, I, I might regret saying this. Who knows? But if anyone has any questions about auditioning for Dollywood, um, let me know. Because I I have, like, the details. And I feel like any actor or musician or whoever's auditioning, you know, 
auditionee worth their salts should research, you know, how the audition is going and what you need to prepare for. Like they tell you obviously, but like, it's nice mm-hmm. to talk to someone who's done it before. Um, yeah. so if I get it, that would be really great. Um, I would love to do it. I would love to work for Dolly. Um, it was really cute because one of the auditioners noticed on my resume that I was in the music video with, uh, Galantis featuring yeah. Dolly Parton or, I mean, that's how it's like set up but Dolly Parton is really the one that runs it and it's featuring Galantis not really but (laughs) she's the name (laughs) she's a queen so that's right exactly right exactly so there was that and um I felt like really good about it because I also was reminded of something that Amy Poehler said in her book yes please um which I think I am getting way better at recognizing and remembering but um she said to care about the work but not about the result Mm. And that really is, has stuck with me. And uh, I try to take that into every audition now because that's so true. Like you can't, you have to set it and forget it. Like you can't be so desperate because they sense that and it's not a good vibe. And just as long as you're having fun, um, then they'll have fun. And whatever happens is what's supposed to happen. So um, it would be great if I did get a Christmas one because then I could tell my day job um, that, you know, I, they can have enough time I feel <laughs> right but but yeah so I mean apart from that things are good um I have been feeling like I don't know I mean I know people from my work will listen but they know I just feel like I guess frustrated because I spend so much time at work sometimes that I feel like I can't like do ooh, like this or mm. editing or like figure out stuff I want to do for videos because I've got some other projects that I want to do this year like some music videos and some like musical theater like videos and stuff that I want to do and um, it all costs money and takes time and my energy is taken up a lot by my day job so I'm trying to just get back into that mindset because I was in such of that I was in such a mindset in 2000 was it 18 19 whenever I released my record (laughs) um (laughs) I was in such like a balance not I mean it burnt me out but I was in such of like a mindset where I was like okay I have my day job but it doesn't mean anything and even though I'm really tired I have to it's not that it doesn't mean anything it's I'm grateful and I'm paying for my music and my passion with this but now I'm not really in that mindset because for a whole year I've been able to like focus on paying off my debts and just on the job. So I need to get back into the mindset of, you know, your main passion is music and acting. Like we need to get back on that train regardless of the pandemic. Like you can do stuff that is not maybe in person. Like you can still, you know, do videos and try to be creative. So I'm just kind of, you know, wrecking with reckoning with that. Yeah. That's a, it's, it's a tough thing. But I'm really glad you went and did that audition. Me too. Uh, Yeah, I'm really glad too. Honestly, like I was listening to a couple things. Jamila Jamil has a wonderful podcast that you guys should listen to. Um, And I will definitely mention this in another podcast, I feel. But um, in later episodes, you'll also hear that I was on the search for a therapist. And I have one now, which is amazing. It's going well. But we talk about a lot of... um, like of my weight issues and just like the thought processes that come with that and Mm -hmm. how I'm really married to the scale and the scale just like means beauty to me. Like that's what Mm -hmm. I've been finding. Um, And so I've been trying to find a way to break that uh, and just kind of like unlearn that if you will, because that's been ingrained in me for so long. Um, Where was I going with this? (laughs) I started with a uh the podcast that yeah Jamila Jamil has a podcast and she was talking about something we were talking about um doing oh 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 god okay we were talking she had a podcast um where she interviewed the guy uh that wrote the book yes man or whatever Mm -hmm. um the one that said yes to everything and um yeah so that's kind of something that I'm trying to do now just like saying yes to things that I maybe wouldn't normally say yes to just to see and and at the end of the day it can just be a fun story and then I've also been doing yoga with Adrian uh she has a 30-day yoga journey right now but she's just great to to do anyway to um do her videos and today her um practice in her practice she said uh your precious presence because she said some like we were doing a move where you had to like stretch out and like take up space and mm-hmm. stuff. And she was like, you know, just like notice and be aware of your precious presence. So I just want to say that to yeah. everyone. You your presence is precious and you are worthy. <laughs> yes, you are worthy. So. So, yeah, that's kind of what's um what's been going on with me lately. Um, 
I think that's kind of oh oh my god I have been watching this is the last thing I'll say I've been watching religiously British Bake Off <gasps> love it is. British Bake Off oh my god I am obsessed it's so good <laughs> and I texted my friend the other day and I was like um you and me need to be hosts of this thing because she's like so hilarious she'd be better at it than me I feel but because she is a host you should look her up shout out to Chris Carr K-R-I-S dash c-a-r-r i don't know why i said dash i just like wanted you to know that there was a space between chris <laughs> car but anyway <laughs> i texted her i was like we would be so good at hosting this show because <laughs> she's like a stand-up and so funny yeah. and i'm just like a crazy person that could bounce off her <laughs> so anyway um i love it so much and i really want to do a challenge if anyone would be interested in us doing this um and you guys could join along but like do a challenge between friends of like doing our own bake-off oh moment it. and taking pictures yeah. and stuff my friend my coworker did it and um she was like super like great at it shout out to virginia so that's her name <laughs> that's amazing but yeah so I'm down. that's what's up with me okay cool well we should start that we'll let everyone yeah. know when we do for real yeah for real <sighs> so is there anything else in therapy that you need to discuss or anything else that's going on with you for now i don't think i can rant about anything i think i'm pretty I'm pretty set with this new job. We'll see how I feel in a week. I might be a little overwhelmed, but we'll see. Okay. Yes. We'll check back okay. in. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for tuning in. And like Maddie said in the last episode, and as you can probably hear now, if you ever need to talk to someone or whatever, then, you know, reach out. Or if you need help finding a therapist, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some websites that I need. Oh, this that's another great, great, great resource, you guys. Um, there's this p new podcast, Maddie, that I'll have to send you as well. But my therapist sent it to me, and um, it's called Therapy for Black Girls. And it is so good. Uh, it's with this doctor in Atlanta, this psychologist in Atlanta. She's amazing, even if you're not a person of color. Which, by the way, I just learned this new term, BIPOC. The POC stands for person of color. I stands for indigenous B, I can't remember what it stands for, but it was in Cosmo. Oh. So. <laughs> okay. so anyway, my point is that even if you're not a person of color, it's very worth listening mm -hmm. to. And they have great resources to ha of how to find um, a therapist in your area. So if that's something that you're seeking, um, you know, then that's available yeah, to you. That's awesome. Well, yeah. we will. OK, well, catch back up next week then. Yes, yeah, sounds great. Thanks for listening. See you next time for episode three and more therapy. More therapy. <laughs> Always good. Bye. Okay, bye. There's a park and some pals and there's also therapy too.